Welcome to Bench to Bedside, a weekly series of live conversations about recent advances in cancer, from the research bench to treatment at the patient's bedside. And now, your host and the director of the University of Kansas Cancer Center, Dr. Roy Jensen. As a National Cancer Institute designated cancer center, the University of Kansas Cancer Center provides the most advanced radiation oncology treatments for prostate cancer. These advances in radiation treatment offer our patients higher cure rates, fewer side effects, and a better quality of life. Hi, I'm Dr. Roy Jensen, Director of the University of Kansas Cancer Center. Welcome to today's Bench to Bedside. With me to talk about advancements in radiation oncology for treating prostate cancer is Dr. Ronald Chen, Chair of Radiation Oncology at the University of Kansas School of Medicine. Dr. Chen, is an internationally renowned physician and researcher and wrote the first textbook on stereotactic body radiation, which has sold more than 12,000 copies worldwide. And joining us by Skype is Cameron Poindexter to take your questions. Dr. Chen, what advances in radiology technology can uh, we look forward to? Well, I think uh, you know, radiation has been around for a long time and it's a proven way to cure many types of cancer. The improvements in radiation treatment over the last 20 or even 10 years has really been about being more precise and being more accurate. And that's really important because being more pre when radiation can be more precise targeting the tumor, we could uh, result in higher cure rates and also we would cause less damage to the surrounding tissue and therefore cause less side effects. So if we think about how technology overall has improved over the last 10 to 20 years, cell phones, TVs, the technology for cancer treatment like radiation has also improved dramatically over that period of time. So sometimes I hear patients say, well, you know, my father or my grandfather had radiation 30 years ago and, you know, didn't do so well, but really that has dramatically changed because the technology is now more accurate. We can see the tumor more accurately with modern technology we can target it a lot more precisely with modern radiation therapy, really to the benefit of patients. So Dr. Chen, why uh, do you feel it's so important that uh, we will be able to provide uh, uh, proton therapy, the most technologically advanced method to deliver radiation treatment to cancerous tumors available to our patients? Yeah, I, I think, pro so proton therapy is a very advanced form of radiation. What it's known is that it's uh, very uh, effective in treating cancer, but also it can cut down on side effects and damage to surrounding tissue. The, the reason I think our cancer center is pursuing or building a proton facility, which is actually a very costly project, is because we are an NCI-designated uh, cancer center, and, and I think as that, we have a responsibility to offer all the treatment options to patients in this area. So for example, if a patient needs systemic therapy, we offer chemo, we offer immunotherapy, we offer targeted therapy. If a patient needs radiation, we currently have IMRT, SBRT, brachytherapy, but proton therapy is a tool that we currently do not have, and there's no one that offers proton therapy in, the, in this region. So patients here in Kansas City today who need proton therapy, whether it's pediatric cancer or some types of brain tumor or patients who have a recurrence, if they need proton therapy, they have to go out of state to receive this treatment and stay there for several weeks. So we need to really be able to offer every option. We're missing proton therapy. We're building that to the benefit of our patients here so we can offer all the options so they can stay here and receive world-class treatment that they need for the cancer. So uh, uh, I know you just went through a, a list of some of the options that we have. What, uh, what's the full range of, of uh, types of radiation oncology technology? that the University of Kansas Cancer Center uh, offers here that others uh, don't necessarily offer locally? Yeah, I think, you know, and I'll, uh, I specialize in prostate cancer, so I'll talk a little bit about prostate cancer as an example to show some of the technology and radiation that we offer here. So uh, historically, uh, several years ago, radiation used to be given to treat cancer in small doses every day. So you give a small dose every day, and for prostate cancer, you actually need nine weeks of treatment uh, on a daily basis to treat prostate cancer. So really, it would take a patient's daily time for uh, two entire months to treat prostate cancer. Well, that has changed. With uh, advances due to clinical trials and results from those, 
Now we treat prostate cancer in about half the time. So here at KU, the majority of our patients receive about five weeks of radiation therapy instead of nine weeks, and that's equally effective and also cuts down on the expenses for the patient and really to take, uh, improves the quality of life for the patient not having to come for every day for two months. So that's a huge advance, being able to cut down on the treatment time, and we offer the five weeks of treatment, and we've been doing that for several years. There's actually another uh, form of radiation for early prostate cancer, so patients who have the very early diagnosis. We actually offer stereotactic radiation, which is a very precise form of radiation that actually treats prostate cancer in one week. So if you think about a prostate cancer patient five or 10 years ago, having to spend every day for two months getting treatment, now it's down to five weeks or even one week of treatment. I think that's a significant improvement, and we offer that here. Another thing that we offer here in, in the form of radiation is called brachytherapy. Brachytherapy is actually putting the radiation directly into the prostate, so it's as, as targeted and as precise as it gets. We're actually putting the radiation directly into the prostate. It's a one-time procedure. And through clinical trials, brachytherapy has been shown to improve the cure rates of high-risk, uh, aggressive prostate cancer by 20%. And so if you have access to brachytherapy and you have high-risk prostate cancer, brachytherapy will cure a lot more patients than traditional radiation. And we had the largest program of brachytherapy in this area as well. So five weeks of radiation, one week of stereotactic radiation, brachytherapy to cure more patients. Those are some of the technologies that we offer here at KU. And we have a tremendous team and tremendous experience offering these treatments for patients. So Dr. Chen, tell us a little bit about uh, your textbook uh, that you wrote. Um, and the title was Hyperfractionated uh, Stereotactic Radiation Therapy, a Practical Guide and Its Significance uh, in the Field of, of Oncology. Yeah. So I think part of our responsibilities as, uh, so I'm, I consider myself not only a physician, but also a researcher and a teacher. And that's why I'm here at, a, at KU Cancer Center. So I take care of patients, but I also need to advance the treatment for cancer patients and then teach other physicians how to do that. And that's where this textbook came in. Hypofractionated radiation is shortening radiation for many types of cancers, which has now been proven to be very effective. So prostate cancer I just talked about used to be nine weeks. We don't do nine weeks anymore. We do five weeks or one week. That's proven to work, but it's not offered everywhere in the country or in other countries. Uh, breast cancer used to be six weeks of daily treatment radiation, and now it's three to four weeks. Uh, the, the hypofractionated, which is shortening the treatment, now works for many, many cancers because of the clinical trial results. And so writing a textbook to really summarize all of this latest information and publishing that so then physicians across the country and even other countries can learn how to adapt these newer treatments to benefit their patients, I think was a responsibility that I felt. And so publishing that book, and now it's sold 12,000 copies around not only this country, but internationally, I think we're teaching physicians how to adapt to the new treatments, and I think it really benefits the patients. Stereotactic radiation, which is another part of that book, is, is basically a newer technology that's more precise targeting the tumor. But when you are more precise targeting a tumor, you also have to be careful not to miss the tumor and treat it adequately. And so the textbook also addresses that so then uh, physicians can utilize the new technology appropriately to cure the patients. So if you're just joining us, we're here with radiation oncologist Dr. Ronald Chen to talk about advancements in radiation oncology treatment options for prostate cancer at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. Cameron Poindexter is here to take uh, your questions, and remember to share this conversation with those you think it would help. Please use the hashtag bench to bedside. So Dr. Chen, as a physician uh, scientist, uh, you lead a number of national and international uh, clinical trials in prostate, bladder, and testicular cancer. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your research program. Yeah. There are a couple of aspects of my research. Uh, one uh, area of my research is pushing the treatment so we can cure more patients. Another aspect of my research is focusing on quality of life uh, for patients after treatment, which I think is also a very important issue. So on one hand, we want to cure more patients who have very advanced disease. And so one of the trials that I currently need, lead nationally is for patients who are diagnosed with node-positive prostate cancer. Node-positive prostate cancer 
is actually stage four disease, and the cure rates currently are not uh, optimal. And so in that trial that, uh, that I lead, and we have over 100 centers participating on, across the country, we are actually pushing the treatment further to see if we can cure more patients. Actually, one of my patients recently was enrolled on that trial and got additional treatment that hopefully will add to the cure rate for, for his cancer. Another aspect of my research is really trying to look at survivorship issues. We know that many patients are actually cured, but then the treatment leaves them with long-term and, and maybe even lifelong quality of life issues. And so another trial that I lead nationally uh, is actually looking at prostate cancer survivors to see if they're getting a proper uh, clinical care, cardiovascular disease, monitoring, exercise. And that's also a very important aspect because we don't just want to treat patients, but we also want to take care of them afterwards to maximize their health. So those are two clinical trials that I lead nationally. They are both uh, sponsored by the National Cancer Institute. Um, I actually uh, 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 co-lead uh, more than 10 other trials across the country in prostate cancer, in bladder cancer, and testicular cancer. And really, I think as a uh, faculty member at the KU uh, Cancer Center, it's our responsibility to continue to design and implement clinical trials so that we can continue to improve uh, the treatment for patients with cancer. Great. So, uh, Cameron, it sounds like we have our first uh, question. Yes, we have two questions. And the first question is, if you are due for a prostate cancer screening, should you reschedule for a later date due to COVID-19, or should people get screened on a regular schedule? Excellent question. Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and actually, it's, a, it's an issue that Dr. Jensen and I have uh, tried to talk about over the last several weeks. Uh, COVID has, uh, over the last several months, uh, eight months or so, has really led to a lot of cancellations of cancer screening. Prostate cancer screening has been canceled, breast cancer screening, colorectal cancer screening. And that's going to have an impact in terms of mortality for patients. We know that screening uh, helps diagnose cancer at an early stage, and that's the best way to cure the cancer. So delay screening is gonna to lead to more advanced diagnosis and maybe even missing the opportunity for cure. So it's specifically to prostate cancer, absolutely we would advocate to schedule the screening. Uh, and, and it is actually, I think all the healthcare facilities now have been able to really implement safe precautions in the clinical space. I think the clinic is probably actually the safest place to be if you were to be out of the house anywhere. So I would advocate for a screening for prostate cancer, scheduling that appointment. There was actually a recent study that was published uh, that showed that the COVID impact on delay screening across the country, variety of cancers, uh, is actually gonna lead to an additional 30,000 deaths, cancer deaths, because of delayed diagnosis and delayed treatment. So this is a serious issue. And I do think screening is safe and we should do that. And uh, I would point out that uh, both Dr. Chen and I were on a Zoom call with uh, the director of the National Cancer Institute yesterday and he brought up this exact point. And in fact, a study came out of the NCI which showed that if you just take breast and colon cancer, uh, the estimate is that over the next 10 years, there will be 10 to 11,000 people die from just those two types of cancer uh, alone. So, um, an, uh, do we have another question, Cameron? Yes, we actually have um, two more questions. Um, the second one is, are there clinical trials available for, to prostate cancer patients? How does patients learn if a trial would be right for them? Right, I think that's a really important question. Uh, there absolutely are actually many uh, clinical trials available for prostate cancer patients. And I think one of the things that I always advocate to patients is, is when you have a cancer diagnosis and you're seeing a doctor for consultation to talk about the options, always ask if there is a clinical trial available. And, and, uh, and, and hopefully the answer is yes, because um, uh, at an, uh, certainly here at KU Cancer Center, there's clinical trials available for every type of cancer. And sometimes that's really the, the best treatment for a patient to be able to access the latest uh, drugs or uh, latest uh, technology available. So, um, and the other place that people can go to, which is a little bit hard, there's actually a website called clinicaltrials.gov. Clinicaltrials.gov, you can actually search your condition, prostate cancer, breast cancer, or colon cancer, and it will actually show the entire list of available clinical trials and where they are available. So if you want to do your own research, clinicaltrials.gov is the one way to go. 
if you uh, ask your physician, uh, sometimes also actually sometimes your physician that you ask may or may not know about all the trials available. So a second opinion may also be a good idea to ask those questions. The next question, Cameron. Yes. Um, are men with prostate cancer diagnosed early in its early stages benefit from this radiation therapy or is it too soon? Does it need to be a little bit advanced? Yeah. Uh, uh, so um, diagnosing any cancer at the early stage is always the goal. So, so for prostate cancer, we always want to diagnose the cancer as early as possible. Now, for patients with prostate cancer, if it's very, very early, sometimes we call them Gleason 6 low-risk cancers. So for patients with Gleason 6 low-risk cancers, sometimes actually just monitoring would be a good idea. And they may not need any treatment if you have Gleason 6 low-risk cancer. You can just monitor it. But once it turns into a little bit more than that, not advanced, but, uh, but maybe Gleason 7, which is still early, uh, that needs treatment, uh, and when the patient needs treatment, radiation is very effective, and so is surgery. And every patient really should hear about both surgery and radiation as options because they're both excellent ways to, to cure prostate cancer, whether it's early or advanced. So, uh, Dr. Chen, I know that you were on a, a panel uh, on Monday at the Association for American Cancer Institute's uh, uh, annual meeting talking about screening and, and, and prostate cancer. And could you just uh, kind of give us a summary uh, of, of your presentation around whether or not um, uh, one should be screened for prostate cancer? Yes, I, I think that's a very important topic. Uh, sometimes uh, in the media or, or on the webs uh, websites, there may be some controversy about whether prostate cancer screening is a good idea or not a good idea. I think actually uh, for those of us who follow the clinical trials and follow the research, prostate cancer is absolutely a good idea. Uh, diagnosing in cancer early is the most way, best way to cure a, a patient. So prostate cancer screening is, is definitely a good idea. The proper age uh, of men who should have prostate cancer screening, usually we would recommend screening starting at age 50, uh, and going all the way until maybe about 75 or so. That, and for there are certain groups of men who have a higher risk, so maybe uh, people who have a family history of prostate cancer, or uh, uh, black men too are also a higher risk, and those men probably should start screening at 40 or 45. But absolutely, prostate cancer screening saves lives, and I think it's important to do. Thanks. Uh, sounds like we have another question. Yes, we have two more. Um, the next one is, if a PCA patient with oligomestatic with stable disease limited to three sub-centimeter lymph nodes, is radiation an option? So uh, I think the, uh, so um, uh, uh, I'll give some general advice because I don't know this patient's uh, situation exactly. But I, if the question is, if a patient has prostate cancer and it has spread to three lymph nodes, uh, then, then I would think that for the majority of patients in that situation, radiation is absolutely an option. And, and I would advocate uh, for this patient to talk to a radiation oncologist to sort of dig into more detail. But yes, we actually do use radiation to treat patients with prostate cancer who have lymph node metastasis. All right. Is there another question, Cameron? Yes, the next question is, if a cancer has had no change in cancer, could he safely go back on testosterone therapy that he had been on prior to prostate cancer diagnosis? He was yeah. on it due to a preparatory uh, non-cancerous tumor that has been operated on twice, but still some there. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. So the general question there is, if somebody has had prostate cancer, and it's been treated, can that uh, person uh, take testosterone supplementation? Because some people have low testosterone and they need testosterone supplementation to improve their quality of life. So uh, uh, that's a, a bit of a balance a question. Uh, in general, my approach is that if the prostate cancer has been treated and if there's no evidence of recurrence, if a cancer has been potentially cured with no evidence of recurrence, for at least two years after treatment, then I would feel comfortable uh, with going back on testosterone supplementation. And, and I would also advocate that testosterone supplementation be uh, increasing testosterone to a normal level, but not a super normal level. And so I think the testosterone level needs to be monitored closely. 
I think if there is recurrence, if there's evidence of recurrence of prostate cancer, then I do not advocate for testosterone supplementation because testosterone can actually help make the cancer grow faster. So if we think the patient is potentially cured, no recurrence for two years, then it's probably okay. But if there is recurrence or any concern that there's still cancer left behind, then I don't think it's a good idea. Next question, Cameron. Yes. Our audience would like to know about the amazing free screening event KU recently had. Uh, that's a really great question. I know Dr. Jensen uh, was an uh, integral part of this as well. I think we were just talking a few minutes ago about the importance of screening and, al and also the impact COVID has had on screening cancellations over the last eight months. We absolutely think uh, that screening is important, and so to do something about this, uh, we, uh, KU Cancer Center, actually, through the Masonic Cancer Alliance, offer free screening at five different locations uh, uh, in September to really try to make up for some of that gap. And, and Masonic Cancer Alliance has subsequently scheduled another screening event, I believe, in the Olathe area, and there's also going to be another one in Topeka. So I think those free screening events is part of our duty as a cancer center, NCI Destiny Cancer Center, to really serve the community. And we really want to continue to advocate the importance of getting regular checkups to, to screen for cancers. So Dr. Chen, what uh, makes the University of Kansas Cancer Center different from other places that you have practiced? Yeah, I'll, I'll just... Uh, maybe sort of tell the audience a little bit about myself. So I grew up in Topeka and uh, went to Topeka West High School. I went to KU for my undergraduate degree. And then I went to Boston for medical training for 10 years. I was at Harvard Medical School and I did my residency radiation oncology at Harvard. So I've, I, I've seen the cancer centers there. And then after finishing my medical training, I went to University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill and I was there for 10 years on faculty. So uh, one of the things uh, that I think makes KU Cancer Center very similar to the other places that I've been is that KU Cancer Center is a high-powered, top-tier cancer center in the country, just like Harvard, just like UNC. And the reason for that, that we know for sure, is because we are a National Cancer Institute designated cancer center. That's a very high bar that we have to prove to the NCI that we have the world uh, class expertise, world-class research, clinical trials, world-class facilities, world-class treatment to be able to meet that top-tier bar. And so KU is very similar to Harvard and UNC in that regard. But one of the things that I think makes KU a little bit different is that when I was in Boston, there were multiple high-power cancer centers in Boston. When I was in North Carolina, we had UNC and Duke nearby and Wake Forest nearby. So the community in those areas were served by several high-power cancer centers. They had a really good selection and really great care. One of the things that makes K unique here is that we are the only NCI-designated cancer center in this region for hundreds of miles. And so we have an extra responsibility to take care of patients and really push us every day for the technology, for the research, to, to help the, 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 the residents of this area. So just following up on that, uh, Dr. Shen, what are some of the advantages you see for patients who seek care at an NCI-designated cancer center? Yeah, I think the, the statistic that's often quoted is that patient, cancer patients who receive care at an NCI-designated cancer center are 25% more likely to survive the cancer, 25% more likely. And I think that's really important because if, if somebody has a life-threatening diagnosis like cancer, and you know that going to a, a resource like an NCI dense cancer helps you beat it 25% more likely, I think everybody would try to do that as much as possible because this is a really serious diagnosis. And I think the reason that statistic is true uh, is multiple, uh, there's multiple facets of this. I think NCI density cancer centers have world-class expertise. So we have the physicians who not only take care of patients, but they do the research, they write the textbooks, they lecture all over the country to teach people how to treat cancers in, in the right way. So the expertise is important. Having all the clinical trials available so patients have access to the latest drugs and the latest technology, I think is also important. And so the expertise, the research, and really the facilities and, and all the latest treatments available, I think together make up for that 25%. Uh, and again, uh, it's, I think the, when I lived in Boston, I feel so lucky to be close to a high-powered 
uh, uh, international leading cancer program in Boston. And I feel the same way in Chapel Hill, and I feel the same way here in Kansas City. Having this NCI Cancer Center in this region is really a great resource. Cameron, uh, sounds like we have another question. Yes, we have two more questions. The next question is, if Gleason 6 is the current diagnosis, can patients use testosterone therapy? Is there no therapy yet? Just watching it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, f uh, so a Gleason 6 cancer is often considered a, a low-risk cancer. Again, I want to be a little bit broad because I don't know this exact patient's diagnosis, but a Gleason 6 cancer is often classified as low-risk cancer and usually just needs to be watched. And the reason it just needs to be watched is because watching a Gleason 6 cancer is safe, and, and actually clinical trials have shown that uh, for a Gleason 6 cancer, if we watch 100 patients with Gleason 6 cancer for 10 years, and that's you know active monitoring. You have to check the PSAs regularly. You have to do a biopsy every once in a while. But of 100 patients who we just watch in Gleason 6 cancer, if we watch them for 10 years, only half of them actually need treatment during the 10 years of time. And that means that for the other half of the patients, they can avoid treatment, they can avoid all the potential side effects of treatment and still not need treatment, not, it will not die from this disease. And it's a little bit like a Gleason 6 cancer, it's a little bit like high blood pressure or high cholesterol. Sometimes you need treatment, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you just need to watch it. And so if we can save half of the patients from actually needing treatment, I think that's really a benefit. And so uh, for a Gleason 6 patient, if it's low risk, our common recommendation is active surveillance. Uh, testosterone uh, really is not a treatment for prostate cancer. It has no effect in getting rid of prostate cancer. Now, if a patient has low testosterone and has side effects from low testosterone, can that person have testosterone supplementation to get that to be a normal level? Probably okay, but testosterone itself is not a prostate cancer treatment. Is there any other questions, Cameron? Yes, we have one more. Um, it's related to genetics. If family history, grandfather, dad, uncle had prostate cancer, is surgery or radiation better if son gets diagnosed? Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, actually, surgery and radiation have been proven to be equally effective, equally curative for prostate cancer, whether it's Gleason 6 or 7 or 8 or 9 or 10. Uh, and, and that's been demonstrated through clinical trials. So there was actually a clinical trial that was done where you flip of a coin, uh, half of the prostate cancer patients got surgery, half the prostate cancer patients got radiation, and they followed them for 10 years, and they've continued to follow these patients. Surgery and radiation had absolutely the exact same results in terms of curing the patient, survival, recurrence. The, the data were exactly the same. And so, but, but the, on the other hand, surgery and radiation do cause different side effects. And sometimes that, if the cure is the same and the side effects are different, sometimes patients look at the side effects of surgery versus radiation to make that decision. But, but, but the cure rate is absolutely the same between surgery and radiation, including for people with a family history. Okay. Sounds like we have another question. Yes, we do. I am Gleason 10 as of June 2019. However, I am doing very well just on hormone therapy. I did chemo, but my PSA had already dropped below one before I started. Is the Gleason assessment sometimes wrong? Ah, uh, the the uh, can the Gleason score be so? Um, again, trying to uh, try to figure out what the clinical situation is. I think if a patient has Gleason 10 cancer and has received chemotherapy and hormone therapy, but no surgery and no radiation then probably there's metastasis. And so I'm guessing that there's metastasis because if there were no metastasis, then surgery or radiation would have been part of the equation. And so, uh, so if there is metastasis, that really does go along with the Gleason 10 cancer. Gleason 10 cancer is pretty aggressive and uh, is likely a metastasized. So, but I think it is good to hear that, that there's been a good response to treatment. Uh, but that Gleason score probably is correct. The other thing that I would add to this, which again, I think second opinion is always a good idea, even for patients with metastasis, metastatic prostate cancer, sometimes radiation can still help the patient live longer. Uh, in certain situations, for patients who just have a few metastases, 
actually radiation to the prostate is still a standard treatment and actually can improve the survival life expectancy for the patient. And so if that were the situation, if the metastasis number is not very high, then radiation should be considered for this patient. All right, we want to make sure we get to uh, all of our questions. Do we have any other questions, Cameron? Not at the current moment. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Chen, uh, what would you most like our listeners to take away uh, uh, from this session today? Yeah, I, I think uh, two aspects. I think one, I always encourage uh, people to, with a cancer diagnosis to seek a second opinion. Uh, I think uh, a lot of times when somebody's diagnosed with cancer and then their doctor sends them to another specialist, that's great. I think you want to really have an opinion on what the treatment options are available. But for a serious diagnosis like cancer, sometimes the doctors may or may not have all the options available. So getting a second opinion just to make sure that you do hear about all the options and then you're actually able to make an informed decision, especially for cancer, is really important. So we would advocate for a second opinion. And now that there's telehealth, second opinion is really, is really quite easy. I think you know here at KU, because of COVID, we've developed a telehealth program. We would actually do a second opinion for a cancer patient within the same week that they call through telehealth. So you don't have to wait, you don't have to delay your treatment, and a second opinion to hear about all the treatment options from the world-class experts, I think is really important for a patient. The other thing that I would advocate for is, uh, somebody mentioned before, is ask about clinical trials. Clinical trials is really important, uh, and I think it sometimes it, it can actually uh, really improve or expand the number of options the patient has. And so I would always ask uh, the physician, if you're a patient, are there any clinical trials available for me, either here or somewhere in the close by? I think that's a really important question for patients to ask as well. All right. Uh, before we close out, any additional questions that have come in, Cameron? Yes, we have two more questions. The first one is, is proton therapy more precise and lower risk of damage to non-cancerous surrounding tissue? The answer is yes. And so pro the, the advantage of proton therapy is that it actually does cause less damage to surrounding tissue. That, that, and that's exactly the reason that we are building a proton facility is to be able to offer that to patients here. Um, one, there was a recent study that showed that um, it compared, so some patients with cancer need both chemo and radiation. And so there was actually a recent study that looked at patients who get both chemo and radiation. Some of the patients got proton radiation with chemo. The other uh, patients got regular radiation and chemo. And that study found that patients who got the proton radiation had less side effects and some of them uh, less, less severe, so they don't have to be hospitalized for those side effects. And so really the major advantage to put on therapy is really to reduce side effects from treatment, uh, and, but also maintain the cure rate uh, for the patient. The last question is, please explain the side effects of radiation versus surgery. Ah. So uh, I think it's about prostate cancer. So, uh, and I think, uh, I'll, I'll be a little bit general here, but I think, uh, I think you should also ask your physician about that as well. There actually have been a lot of studies to look at side effects of prostate uh, surgery, prostatectomy, and also prostate radiation. So many, many studies have looked at this. Actually, that's also a major area of my research focus. So I've studied thousands of patients in terms of their quality of life after treatment. The studies have consistently shown that uh, patients with prostate cancer who get surgery are more likely uh, to have uh, uh, urinary leakage uh, uh, and also erectile dysfunction. And so those are some of the side effects surgery could cause, urinary leakage and erectile dysfunction. And for radiation, uh, radiation could cause uh, some bladder irritation, but less leakage. Radiation does not cause leakage as much. Uh, and radiation traditionally has uh, also caused some bowel irritation, although recent technology has improved on that. And so uh, really there's trade-offs between surgery and radiation from the side effects. Uh, and, and that's really, I think, been very well established through a lot of research. But the, really the cure rate is the same between the two. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Chen, for that uh, very informative uh, discussion. That's it for today. To learn more, please visit KUCancerCenter.org forward slash prostate. Join us next time for Bench to Bedside. Thanks.